Let's talk a little bit about what we should be eating. And maybe we'll start off with satiety. First, what satiety means, but then how can we upregulate through our food? How can we upregulate satiety signals? Let's start there. Let's let's start with those with those two questions. Gotcha. So satiety is just the opposite of hunger. You know, you're you're full basically. And uh, satiety is important because er pretty much every single human and animal on earth just eats until they're full and then they stop eating. That's basically how it works. Unless you're starving and then you eat because you don't have any food. But most humans and animals are eating until they feel full. And your, your brain doesn't really know how much you've eaten. It's guessing, right? So it takes maybe hours for all the food you ate to be digested and enter your bloodstream and end up wherever it's going to go. And by then it's too late. You've all, you have to stop eating at some point and your brain has to guess when you've eaten enough. And your brain does that thanks to, you know, millions of years of evolution where you can kind of sense what you're eating by chewing and swallowing and weight and volume in your stomach and weight and volume in your gastrointestinal tract and the foods that have been in your environment before and the things you've eaten before and what ended up happening downstream. You're kind of guessing, okay, I think I ate enough. I think I'm full, but it is just a guess. And uh, it's very heavily influenced by protein percent, by energy density, by how tasty things are and hedonics and flavor combinations. And we've pretty much broken the system by just sucking all the calories out of foods with refined carbs and refined fats, basically sugar and oil, and then making these ultra tasty, ultra hedonic, high sugar, salt, fat, you know, combinations that where you you're full, but you still eat more because it's so hedonic and tasty and delicious and dopamine spiking and addictive and and all that sort of thing. So now you're looking at a scenario where just eating to satiety isn't going to work when the foods in your environment are super low in protein, super high energy right. density, way overpacked with carbs and fats, and then so delicious that you're going to overeat just because you're addicted to the dopamine spike you get from Oreos. So that's like, that's what satiety is. And that's kind of how we've broken it with the modern food supply. And that's kind of why you need to worry about the satiety per calorie of the foods that you're choosing and food choice becomes a super big deal. And so if we are thinking about prioritizing protein and we're pulling the protein out of the percentage, we're, we're making it a gram target. What is a reasonable protein target that we want to be thinking about? And I'll you know, we've all heard the one gram per pound of ideal body weight as a, as a starting point. I want to put a little caveat here and say the cohort that I want you to speak to is these perimenopausal and menopausal women who, like me, grew up in the high carb, low fat, you know, count 10 grapes and two almonds as your snack kind of, you know, it's like one, you know, two meals and a sensible shake. And what was that? What was that? Oh, it was like two meals and a sensible shake at oh, night. Right. What, what was that called? I remember that commercial for Slim Fast or something. Slim Fast. That was it. Slim mm -hmm. Fast. So we have all of this conditioning from, you know, growing up in the 80s and the 90s, et cetera. So what would be an appropriate gram, protein gram target for a perimenopausal and menopausal woman who, as we know, we're seeing some of these metabolic shifts in her. We're seeing these sex hormone, these anabolic hormones decline, or maybe we're seeing, you know, that fat distribution change in her as well. Right, right, right. So basically every single client you have, they don't, they don't want weight loss. They want fat loss and, and they right. want, they basically want body recomposition, higher lean mass, which is bone and muscle and function and looking good and fat loss at the same time. So you want more lean mass and less fat mass. That's basically more protein and less carbs and fats. And so you can kind of look at your diet from like a protein to energy standpoint where you want more protein and less non-protein energy. But the protein target it is based on, it's, you can't base it on what you weigh because you might be like 10,000 million pounds overweight. So you have to base it on how much you should weigh, basically ideal body weight. I like to calculate that using height. So you should basically eat a gram per pound of ideal body weight based on your height, like what you would weigh if you were completely ripped and jacked and totally at your goal and on a bodybuilding stage. You know what I mean? That is the weight you'd want to use and it's a gram per pound. You know, it, it's, it's, and of course it doesn't have to be exact, you know, and anywhere from 0.75 grams per pound to 1.25 grams per pound, basically gram per pound, you know, plus or minus, or, reasonable amount would be a really good target. But yes, my, my, my favorite just 
rough advice is a gram per pound of absolutely ideal body weight if you were completely perfect proportions based on your height. And so what if you're consuming north of that? So I'm I'm definitely consuming more than one gram per pound of ideal body weight. I'm probably at like maybe one three, one four, which may or may not be correct, but I feel really good with that. Tell me, is there any, certainly you might have, you know, for some individuals, you might find that there might be some GI distress with too much protein, especially if the bolus if you have too much in one sitting, let's say, is there any, you know, we talked about the area under the curve for intermittent fasting. Is there, are you riding the area under the curve by eating more and more protein or more protein than the 0.75 to 1.25 grams that you just laid out? Well, yeah, I mean, it's always a too much and too little of everything. Basically everything in your life is on this U-shaped curve where there's too much and too little. If you eat zero grams of protein, you're going to die. If you eat a 100% protein, you can't convert it into energy fast yeah. enough and you'll yeah. actually die of energy calorie starvation as well. So you can't eat 100% protein and you can't eat 0% protein and you have to be somewhere in between. But there's a lot of leeway on the higher end. Now on the low end, it gets scarier and scarier. You will start losing bone, you will start losing muscle and low protein diets can literally cause a sarcopenia osteopenia and all sorts of triage problems because your body just stops growing you know hair and nails and things that aren't have protein in them but are not absolutely essential so you're you're not going to get into nearly as much trouble on the high end as long as you don't have some weird genetic problem where you can't basically deaminate a uh, protein fast enough then you can really exceed you know we have animal studies where we're feeding them 50% of their calories from protein and they're super lean, super jacked, but they're and super hungry all the time, but they are still alive and it doesn't seem to be terribly damaging. So you really almost most normal healthy people don't really have to worry about quote unquote too much protein. That's basically not even a thing. So no, I would not be worried about that. But you'll find that as you crank the protein percent higher and higher, you're just hungry all the time because you just can't s s extract enough energy from it. It's just not efficient enough. And that's why nobody's living higher than about 40% protein for any length of time. I mean, maybe a few permalean bodybuilders are higher than that, but it's really hard to crank the protein set that high for any length of time because you just get hungry. Yeah, and I, I I wanted to bring up the bodybuilder example because I think that there's a lot, irrespective, you could be talking about bikini competitors, wellness competitors, figure competitors for women, and then of course the physique competitors for men. I think that there's a lot that we can learn in terms of body recomping, well, leading up to a show, and then of course what happens afterwards as they're trying to limit the amount of fat that they gain, you know, as they're as they're coming off of a show as well. I do think that the if we sort of look to the general composition of their diet, you're going to find to your point that 40%, maybe 50, maybe on the upper end, 50% of their calories are coming from protein and then kind of, you know, whatever else to, you know, whatever else combination of, of carbohydrates and, and fat to sort of fill that. And maybe we don't want to get stage lean because there's some, there's lots of problems for, you know, we can talk about losing your menstrual cycle and thyroid dysfunction, all that kind of stuff long-term, but we can certainly learn something from them. Even, even in their off season, they're still he consuming, you know, 40%, let's say if their calories are coming from protein. So I think that that's something to, something not to ignore. It's not nothing. What I wanted to ask you about was protein per meal. So I tend to have my biggest protein meal in the morning just because it's, I like to eat before I train. So I'll have sort of a big bolus of you have some oatmeal and some like whey protein powder. There was a study and I'm forgetting the authors now. It was just done on men, but they, you know, the conventional wisdom was your body is not able to make use of anything north of 40 or 50 grams of protein. And there was a study that came out a couple months ago where they had males who I think they consumed a hundred grams of protein and they were still able to make use of like, they thought, you know, the MPS and everything, the muscle protein synthesis would stop after the 50 grams of protein had been, you know, you know, digested or whatever, but they found that at the 100 gram level that they were still, there was still this sort of residual muscle protein synthesis. So in the same vein, you know, you've said that there's no, 
you run into less problems on the upper end of the curve. Do we also see that at the meal level? So if you're aiming for, I don't know, 30 or 40 grams, but you end up consuming 50 or even even north of 50, do we know if there is an upper limit for muscle protein synthesis? Do we know what a good gram target might be generally for a meal that we're consuming? Right, right. So protein distribution, again, is on this U-shaped curve where if you're, you know, a boa constrictor and you just swallow one rabbit every month or something, you will like slowly, it will take so long to traverse your GI tract, you'll slowly bleed aminos into your bloodstream for a much longer period of time. So much more efficient than humans, isn't it? We have to eat every damn day. I wish it exactly. was a snake it's sometimes. It's absurd. Yeah. <laughs> but then they get real cold. Yeah, that's uh, true. It's the same way with the distribution where you you could get by with one giant protein meal a day and all these things happen. There's this ileal break where uh, the the contents of your small intestine slow way down and you have this giant bolus and it slowly digests and you're bleeding amino acids into your bloodstream for a much longer period of time than anybody thought. And you have muscle protein synthesis for a longer period of time than anyone thought because yes, there was a point where they were like, oh, if you eat more than 30 grams in a meal, you just wasted it. And it's, you know, which it sounds absurd because it is absurd, but then it is on this U-shaped curve where it's not optimal to just have an IV drip of protein with a couple grams every hour because protein is designed to be a bolus phenomenon. And you're supposed to get this certain amount of leucine to trigger muscle protein synthesis. And so it's good to bolus it and have it at discrete intervals. You, so you don't want to eat just five grams of protein every five minutes for 24 hours. But then you also don't want to just eat an entire cow once a year, you know what I mean? So I like m more than one protein meal containing meals in a day. I would say a, a bare minimum would be two large protein containing meals book ending the start and stop of your eating window. And it's important to have that one at the end of your eating window because then you have more amino acids available you know, at night when you're asleep and that kind of thing. But it's uh, really, really important to target that first meal of the day. That's the low hanging fruit. That's what, that's where everybody's falling off a cliff. So like yeah, most yeah. Americans are actually eating enough protein for dinner. Like we're eating enough protein for dinner. We're, we're making it happen. Lunch, not so much. Breakfast is a crime. It's a joke. It's horrible. It's like so low in protein. And we have all these studies where if you eat more protein at your first meal of the day, you're going to just literally eat less calories all day long and you're literally going to be more successful. So the low hanging fruit that most of my patients need to focus on is that first meal of the day, you know, eating way more protein and getting a lot larger amount of protein. So my advice is a bare minimum of book ending your feeding window with a really large uh, bolus of protein, at least 30 to 50 grams and then throwing some more protein maybe in the middle here and there. But I think it's very important to hit that first meal a day. That's that's my advice to most people. And just keeping in, in thinking about action items for our listeners, what are some of your favorite high protein breakfast that you might recommend to your patients? I, I mean, I absolutely love low carbon, low fat fermented dairy. So I'm all over the, you know, any Greek yogurt that's low carbon, low fat, you're uh, Oikos Triple Zero, your Too Good, your Dan and Light and Fit. I'm just eating my body weight in that stuff every day. Absolutely <laughs> love it. I mean, and it's, it's so cheap, easy. and it's so cheap. It's cheap. It's convenient, and <laughs> yeah. you know, it's ultra yeah. processed, by the way. And I literally don't care. So, but that's a whole other rabbit rabbit hole. Right. But I right, love right. love cottage cheese. Well, it's processed. It's not ultra processed. I think when we talk about like you know, applesauce is pro like cooking a steak is technically processing the steak, right? So you're is yogurt ultra processed, would you say, or would you say it's processed? Technically, my Oikos triple zero with artificial sweeteners and that sort of thing oh, is an ultra processed food. That's true. And so yeah, okay. that's why I can't just say just only eat unprocessed food and don't eat ultra processed food because that would be hypocritical of me. But I love any kind of low carb, low fat fermented dairy, get your Greek yogurt, your cottage cheese, your whey powder, whey shake, sure. Any of those, love it all. It's all good. Also love egg whites, phenomenal breakfast item. I'm yes. making, you know, egg white scrambles, you, you know, two eggs and then a cup of egg whites, amazing. I'm basically using all kinds of eggs, egg whites, low carbon, low fat fermented dairy, and then any kind of lean meat is, is amazing too. 
Um, and if you're, you know, vegan, sure. Uh, anything uh, legume related, that's soybeans, tofu, edamame, any kind of uh, legume product is okay. I mean, it's not quite as good, but it'll work. Yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, these are my favorites. That's awesome. And soy actually has a pretty good, like it's pretty bioavailable. Like when we compare it to sort of other, we'll say vegan sources or vegetarian sources of protein, like it has, it has better availability. And I think for a woman in my, my recommendation is always whey protein. And I want to ask you a question about whey in a moment, but if someone, if there's a perimenopausal woman, maybe we're starting to see that her estrogen is low and we're, I, I will add soy back into her diet and soy protein is a really nice way to do that as well. It's a little mildly, you know, estrogenergic and, and it's also highly bioavailable as well. So it's a bit, for me, it's my favorite sort of vegetarian protein source. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Soy is anything legume is your best option as a plant-based person with soy at the top of the heap. Absolutely. Freaking Lily. Agree. Absolutely.